and uh, and that's bad. Uh, so if you think about it, um, you know why we don't reject ourselves if we're healthy is because as we're developing uh, as an embryo, the regulatory T cells that recognize our self antigens are actually killed, and then uh, you know. As a result, the ones that are left are ones that don't think that we're far and big. So if you if you express uh, a gene that's not normally expressed during development, you can set up an immune response. And in fact, this has been documented uh, in, in experimental systems that um, T cell mediated immune rejection of transplanted autologous induced pluripotent stem cells have been rejected. Uh, the other thing, of course, is if you have a genetic abnormality where the abnormality is that you don't make a protein. Say you don't make rhodopsin, and as a result, you never recognize pigmentosa. Well, if you transplant uh, cells that make rhodopsin into the eye, you can end up with uh, an, an unintended immune response. Uh, all of these potential sources of donor tissue will harbor the uh, disease causing mutations, um, and sometimes, in order to do a transplant, we'll have to fix a mutation, and sometimes we probably won't. So, for example, in macular degeneration, although uh, mutations in complement factor H are known to increase the risk of getting AMD, uh, I'm not sure that it would make any difference if you had abnormal complement factor H for five years in the back of your eye. Um, you know, maybe for 20 years or 30 years it would make a difference. Um, and then the last point I'd like to make is that the induced pluripotent stem cells uh, retain some of the epigenetic features of the cell type of origin, which could be very important for cell behavior in the host. Uh, the, you know, before I started learning about this, I used to think that your DNA, to the degree that biology is destiny, your DNA is who you are. And that is not actually true. It is your methylated DNA that is who you are. And the way I learned this was because of the fact that we have identical twin daughters. And they haven't been identical from the day they were born. But if we did a DNA study on them, they would have identical DNA. So why aren't they identical? because the expression of your DNA is not identical. And that's what epigenetic modification does. That's what determines what in your DNA gets expressed and what doesn't. Well, from a practical standpoint, there are two main types of pluripotent stem cells, the embryonic and the induced pluripotent stem cells. Now, the embryonic stem cells are derived from the inner cell mass of the blastocyst, which is the day three to five pre-implantation embryo. And actually, you can harvest those cells without killing the embryo. The technique for doing that was developed by Dr. Robert Lanza, who is one of the principals in advanced cell technology. Um, the uh, uh, formation of induced pluripotent stem cells was induced in the initial studies by inducing the expression of several genes, which are shown in that red circle, uh, to create pluripotency. And this is the work for which Dr. Yamanaka received the Nobel Prize in 2012. But I can assure you that these types of stem cells will not be used in human clinical trials, and I'll explain why in a minute. Uh, a number of different types of cells have been derived from pluripotent stem cells, but most relevant for us today is that RPE cells, photoreceptors, and even an eye cup uh, have been derived from pluripotent stem cells. Now, the therapeutic potential of induced pluripotent stem cells has been fairly well demonstrated, I think. Uh, outside the eye, it's been demonstrated in animal models of sickle cell anemia and Parkinson's disease. But iPS cells that contain multiple viral vector integrations aren't going to be suitable for human clinical trials because of the risk of insertion of mutagenesis and also uh, unpredictable genetic dysfunction. And in addition, the oncogenic properties of some of the transcription factors that are used to induce pluripotency, like CMIC, uh, creates another uh, safety concern. Um, now, the good news is that a lot of progress is being made to improve the safety of induced pluripotent stem cells. For example, uh, we can uh, make iPS cells without using viral vectors. So you could expose the cells to plasmids, which are non-integrating DNA material, and get the expression of uh, 3 4 sux to Akela for and even CMIC. Uh, you can also use vector-free methods like modified synthetic mRNA or proteins uh, that are uh, able to cross the cell membrane and enter the eye, or even exposing uh, uh, cells to embryonic stem cell condition medium to reprogram the somatic cells to pluripotency. Um, to be useful for cell replacement therapy, stem cells, of course, have to survive and integrate and function physiologically in the patient. And depending on the strategy that's used, 
they may also need to proliferate and differentiate. So for example, if you're doing RPE transplantation with a suspension of RPE cells, those cells in the subretinal space are going to have to organize into a polarized monolith. But if you transplant a sheet of RPE cells that's on a parallel membrane that's already differentiated and in a monolayer, then that, that step doesn't need to occur. Uh, of course, um, another issue is integration. Um, so regarding integration, unfortunately, there is well-documented synaptic reorganization of the retina uh, in retinitis pigmentosa that conceivably could limit uh, the extent of transplanted photoreceptor integration with the host. So, for example, in the slide on the right, on the right in panel A, uh, what you see is the synaptic connections between the bipolar cells, which are in green, and the amacrine cells, and that's, those synapses are shown in the red circles, in the histology and in the cartoon below it. And in panel B, this is an a animal that has the uh, P23H mutation, which is a very common mutation in humans with autosomal dominant retinitis pigmentosa. And what you can see here is that these synaptic connections are lost, uh, even though the mutation causing this disease is in the photoreceptors. And it's the photoreceptors, not the bipolar cells, that are dying in retinitis pigmentosa. So that, that sort of makes me wonder, is there any reason at all to believe that you could get a photoreceptor transplant to integrate with the host? And the answer to that question is yes. So I'm going to show you an example from a preclinical study done by Dr. Ali. Um, photoreceptor transplants uh, were done using an animal model uh, of uh, congenital stationary night blindness. And the donor cells were rod precursors. And about 200,000 cells were transplanted subretinally. And these uh, cells that integrated into the retina were found mostly around the transplant site. But uh, actually, they were also distributed far more widely, which is sort of an encouraging finding. So I want to show you a picture of integrated photoreceptors. In panel B, uh, those green cells are the green fluorescent protein-labeled transplanted photoreceptor precursors that matured into photoreceptors that have actually integrated into the host retina. They're circled in the double circles. Now, the fact that there's recovery of anatomy really, unfortunately, doesn't mean very much. Uh, is there any recovery of function? And it turns out that through very clever ways, you can measure different aspects of visual function in these animals. And that's what Dr. Ali and his colleagues did. They looked at contrast sensitivity, which is shown on the y-axis, as a function of the number of integrated photoreceptors, or apparently, integrated photoreceptors. And you can see that there is a positive relationship as the number of integrated photoreceptors increases, so does the animal's contrast sensitivity. And you can actually even measure their visual acuity using grids, uh, sort of like the optokinetic drum, but it's changing the width of the bands. And there's, again, a positive, I wouldn't say linear, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable saying it that way, but there's some sort of a positive correlation between the number of, of transplanted surviving cells and the visual acuity in animals. So I think that shows that photoreceptor transplants can, in principle, work. Now, um, the, the something we tend not to think about is the rest of the microenvironment uh, and what that might do to the success of the transplant. And um, so it's both the retinal and the subretinal microenvironment that could be important. Uh, and let me give you, as a concrete example, uh, AMDIs and the abnormalities in Brooks' membrane that could play a negative role in the survival of RP transplants, stem cell-derived RP transplants in patients with AMD. Uh, you, just to remind you all, there are a number of abnormalities in Brooks' membrane that are associated with age. There's thickening, uh, you know, going from two microns at birth to four to six microns later on. This is a slide from Dr. Sarks's work showing the accumulation of basal linear deposit under the RP plasma membrane. Then there's protein deposition in Brooks' membrane and abnormal protein cross-linking. Uh, unfortunately, some of the types of proteins that are deposited are activated complement. For example, this is taken from the work of JM body, and you can see C3A, activated C3, in other words, deposited in, in nodular or in soft drusen, and C5A also. And this actually might explain why the presence of soft drusen is a risk factor for corbin vessels because C5A stimulates RPE cells to produce VEGF. 
Uh, there's also the lipidization of host membrane, which is well described. This is taken from the work of Vipomerici using something called hot staging polarizing microscopy, where you can see the oil redo uh, staining of the uh, esters, the cholesterol esters of the poly and monounsaturated fatty acids. And then finally, there's actually the formation of death signals in Brooks' membrane, advanced glycation and body. And then if you just look histologically uh, with scanning electron microscopy at the Brooks' membrane of a 10-year-old versus a 91-year-old, um, try to use the pointer here, you can see that it, here the smooth part is actually the RP basement membrane. If we look beneath it at the inner collagenous there, you see that there's a lot of open space in between the collagen fibrils. And in contrast, when we look at a 91-year-old, all that open space is gone. That's because there's a lot of junk clogging up the space between the collagen fibrils. So the, the biological consequences of these changes in Brooks' membrane may not be unimportant. And to illustrate that, I want to show you a, a something, uh, a, an in vitro experiment. It's actually an organ culture experiment using, in this case, the eye of a 92-year-old white woman who had large soft trues, and you can see them in the red circle. And we transplanted uh, embryonic stem cell-derived RPE onto the surface that had been denuded of the native RPE. Uh, and you can see that if we look three weeks later in organ culture, the nuclear density is quite low. It's four nuclei per millimeter of Brooks membrane. Now, normally in a person this age, the nuclear density is 25 to 30. And if you just look at the tissue the surface of this, none of the cells is normal looking, and in fact, there are very few cells. If we take this patient's fellow eye, with the Jerusalem. And we transplant the exact same cells, but we co-incubate the cells with something called bovine <coughs> corneal endothelial cell condition medium. What we'll see is something very different. The nuclear density is now 19 uh, nuclei per millimeter of Brooks membrane. The entire surface of Brooks membrane is covered by the embryonic stem cell derived from DE. And these cells, although not normal appearing, are pretty normal appearing. So my point is that the extracellular matrix abnormalities might be important in transplant survival and behavior, but there could be a way to modulate those issues with other bio biochemical inter interventions. Uh, another point uh, to consider is that we may not want to do replacement therapy. We may just want to do rescue therapy with the stem cells. And the idea of rescue therapy is you use the cell as a factory to produce a bunch of different neurotrophic factors. And it turns out that human embryonic stem cell-derived RPE are such factories. And in fact, they've been shown to produce brain-derived neurotrophic factor and pigment epithelial-derived factor, both of which are very effective neurotrophic agents. Well, this table illustrates the fact that there are a variety of stem cells that have been documented to either rescue and or replace photoreceptors in preclinical models of human retinal degenerative disease and as just one example, I'd like to consider with you in somewhat more detail uh, using induced pluripotent stem cell-derived RPE cells to rescue the retina in the Royal College of Surgeons rat. This is an animal model in which there is a mutation in a protein called MERTK, and the RPE cells can't phagocytize the outer segments properly, and then the retina degenerates. And actually, this exact mutation occurs in some patients with human retinitis pigmentosa, and in fact, there's a gene therapy trial going on in the Middle East to reverse this mutation. So that's another way to try to treat the problem. Well, this work was done by Dr. Pete Coffey at University College in London. And on the left, you can see the transverse section of the RCS retina that shows almost complete absence of the photoreceptors in the outer nuclear layer, which is stained in blue of this sham-treated animal. Uh, the outer segments are stained in red. Now, in contrast, if you treat this animal's liver mate, with the IPS-derived RPE, you see something quite different. You see that the outer nuclear layer is almost normal in thickness, and the outer segments are also quite normal appearing. But uh, once again, restoration of anatomy is not the bottom line here, it's function. And you can measure the animal's visual acuity, and the IPS-RPE transplanted animals have almost normal visual acuity, in contrast to the sham-treated and the uninjected animals. Well, there are a number of human stem cell trials in progress for retinal degenerative disease, as illustrated on this slide. And note that none of these trials uh, is using induced pluripotent stem cells, although an IPS-derived RPE stem cell trial is going to begin in Japan in 2014, and it's being led by Dr. Masa Takahashi. Um, there have been, as probably most of you will 
all of you know, some promising initial results uh, using human embryonic stem cell-derived RPE uh, in a patient with Stargardt disease, and I'd like to briefly show those to you now. Um, this slide shows the results of the patient with Stargardt macular dystrophy operated on by Dr. Steve Schwartz at UCLA. She received human embryonic stem cell-derived RPE, and panel A shows in low and high magnification the area of the transplant preoperatively and one week postoperatively, and at week six postoperatively. And I think that by week six, you can see there's something pigmented in the subretinal space in the transplant area. Now, if we look at panel D for a second, the area in the circle is shown in the OCT. And what you can see there is that there are some bright signals on Brooks membrane that could represent residual RPE cells before the transplant. And if we look at week 12 after the transplant, the OCT of that area shows more of those bright signals. I do not know if those are RP cells or not, of course. Uh, what I can tell is that the retina overlying the transplant and the choroid underlying the transplant doesn't look any different to me. But what is definitely different is the patient's vision. So in her unoperated uh, fellow eye, she remained at hand motion's vision throughout the study. And by week four uh, of her surgery, she had improved to 2,800 uh, in her operated eye and maintained that vision uh, for up to week 12. Uh, in fact, there is even one report on the internet, uh, and this was confirmed to me, uh, of an AMD patient whose uh, vision improved from 2,400 uh, to 2,040 after receiving a transplant of these cells. So, who knows, maybe, maybe this will be easier to do than um, I would say in summary that with certain precautions, uh, stem cells can be produced on MOS safely. Uh, they certainly can be induced to differentiate into ocular cells with the potential for replacement and rescue therapy. Uh, in preclinical models, stem cell-derived RPE and photoreceptors absolutely have been shown to restore anatomy and function in different models of human <coughs> disease, although they're just models of human disease. And of course, the first clinical trials of stem cell therapy uh, for retinal degenerative disease are in progress, as I'm sure you all know. Uh, but I think there are a number of important challenges that remain, um, and the degree to which each of these issues is a challenge may vary by the disease that we're treating. The first would be the abnormal microenvironment of the diseased eye. The second would be the synaptic rewiring of the retina. That's an inevitable accompaniment of any retinal degenerative disease, including macular degenerative and uh, the maintenance of a functional phenotype over time. For example, there's some evidence that embryonic stem cell-derived RPE have a greater ability to maintain functional <coughs> phenotype over time than induced pluripotent stem cell-derived RPE. Uh, we haven't dwelled too much about on the issue of immune rejection, but that's probably going to be an important issue. At least it's an issue that has to be explored carefully. Uh, and then finally, the question of whether we have to transplant healthy cells uh, into the patient, or whether sometimes we can get away with transplanting genetically abnormal cells. And all of these issues, I think, will be worked out over the next decade. Uh, thank you for your attention.